We found that about 50% of men, American men, know basically nothing about their sperm. They don't know what affects the quality. The vast majority, by the way, have no idea that hormone replacement can actually negatively impact the fertility. They assume that taking testosterone, for example, so will actually men. increase your sperm count. Makes a ton of sense. The reality is the total opposite. Health, fitness, mindset, nutrition. Live better and longer. I'm Saad Alam, and let's hone in. We've got... Khalid Kateli here with us. He's the CEO and founder of Legacy. We're incredibly excited to have you. We've known each other for years. Yeah. And I mean, why don't you give us a little bit of a overview on yeah. who you are, what you do? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, I've been following your work for years and it's, it's great to see. I mean, there's just so much overlap between what we do and uh, love watching the progress of Hone over the past few years. Uh, so very happy to be here. I'm the founder and CEO of Legacy. Uh, so Legacy is... Uh, a male fertility focused company trying to change the outdated view that fertility is a women's issue because that's historically how we talk yep. about it. So we developed a product to enable men to test and freeze their sperm without ever having to go to a clinic. So it, let's, let's actually stop there. Yeah. When you say they don't ever, ever, ever have to go to a clinic, what do you mean yeah. by that? Yeah. I mean, I've gone through the process myself, right? You make an appointment, you wait a few weeks, you go in for what is the most awkward experience of your life, yes. which I'll happily describe at another point. <laughs> uh, and you come out of that, you wait, wait a week for your results, you get a piece of paper that looks like you just got faxed a bunch of numbers. Um, we totally overhauled that process. So you can order a kit online, we mail you a kit to your home, you produce a sperm sample from the comfort of your own home, however you want, we don't ask any questions. You scan a QR code when you're done, we send someone to pick it up from your home, we ship it priority overnight to our lab, at which point we can conduct a full semen analysis and cryogenic storage. You can get philosophical about why we're on this planet, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways that you can leave a legacy. There's a lot of things that you might want to do. In fact, you may not even want to have kids. But as a biological organism, our basic biological function is to reproduce. And that's true of any organism, not just ourselves. Mm -hmm. right? And so if you are ever thinking about starting a family, which I would, which I would imagine at least 99% of the world has thought about, then you need to care because that is how you're going to have biological kids. You need a person with sperm, right? And then a person who's able to uh, conceive through that sperm, right? And so only in that way can you actually build a family. Now, the second part of it is if you are thinking about testosterone or testosterone replacement, TRT, then as you mentioned, I mean, TRT is going to bring your sperm count down to effectively zero, mm -hmm. right? So if you're even thinking about this, first thing you should do, test freeze. your sperm, make sure it works, and then freeze it. Yep. And by the way, the testing is important too, not just the freezing, because sperm quality is very closely correlated with your overall health. So mm -hmm. by testing your sperm, you're actually learning in a simple and fairly enjoyable way whether you are healthy as a whole and how your lifestyle might be affecting your sperm quality. We have a customer right now, I'm not gonna mm -hmm. obviously name his name, mm -hmm. professional football player, played for two years, yep. had some brain, yep. had a few concussions, mm -hmm. went on TRT because he wasn't able to bruise himself, and he's now 31 mm -hmm. years old. Yeah can't get pregnant. Yeah. And so we had this very hard conversation where I said, hey, look, yeah. I think this is the moment where you need to stop what you're doing. You need to right. focus on your fertility because when you meet right. that person you want to have a family with, right. there is nothing more devastating than being able to yeah. say, I can't have children. You know, and and there's, there's such an interesting transition, I think, certainly in all, all men's lives or you know, people with sperm, but in your late teens and early 20s, mm -hmm. you are terrified of accidentally getting someone pregnant, right? <laughs> it is literally what you were trained to not do, yep. right? And you are actively working to not have that as an outcome, and that's also when you're most fertile. Yep. And then suddenly you get to your late 20s, especially nowadays, late 20s, early 30s, even mid 30s, and you meet the person with whom you might want to start a family, you yep. have kids, uh, and at that point, your fertility is lower, mm -hmm. the person you're with's fertility is lower, right? Demographically, we're meeting and trying to have kids later, so now you're less fertile, you never even, you know, conceive, no pun intended, of the prospect that you might not be able to have kids when you're trying. And what we found is, you know, infertility affects more and more couples than ever before. The WHO just launched a huge study, by the way, global, showing about one in six couples are facing infertility. One in six. One in six. That's a terrifying number. One in number. six. One in humongous. six. That's a terrifying number. We used to think it was one in seven, one in eight, but it looks like not only is it more of a problem than we ever thought, it seems like the problem's getting worse. 16%, yeah. 17% of people. Six, seven. yeah. I mean, that is massive. Why would yeah. the problem be getting worse, yeah. though? There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, I'd break it out broadly into at a socioeconomic demographic perspective to start. Mm -hmm. So first of all, 
um, the median age relative to about 40 years ago is seven years older. So we're just literally older as a population. Mm -hmm. And what people need to know is, um, as you get older, your fertility declines. That's just that's yep. just fact, right? So that's that's number one. The second is this is more of a socioeconomic trend, but more and more you're meeting the person you want to be with later. Mm -hmm. You're dating later. You're choosing to settle down later. You're getting married later. And by the time you want to have kids, the average age of you know a first time mother has gone up so much uh, that now the average age of the first time mother, if I remember correctly. Um, is more likely to be now in the 31 to 35 age range, whereas historically it was more in the 26 to 30 age range. And so, you know, everyone's older. And so when you are trying to have kids, mm -hmm. you are less fertile, your partner's less fertile. And then you layer on the third part. <clears throat> and the third part is um, we're surrounded by chemicals. Yep. Everywhere around us. Yep. BPAs, phthalates, you know, the glasses that we're drinking from, probably the microphones we're speaking into, Shampoos, the clothes we're wearing, everything. right? All of that is chemicals, which we should talk more about. Um, but this is believed to be one of the reasons why sperm counts are also in the decline. So we've seen sperm counts decline by 50 to 60% over the past 40 years. In the past quarter or half century, yeah. you have seen sperm counts go down by 50 or 60%. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's scary. And you know what that means is you may have half the fertility as your father or grandfather did when he was your age, right? And, and, and sperm, it's not as straightforward as do you have half the sperm, therefore you're half as fertile, mm -hmm. right? So there, there is some nuance there, but it's a scary thing to think about, especially when we know that sperm is a biomarker of your overall health. Mm -hmm. The testosterone level of men over the past three decades mm -hmm. has gone down 26%. I mean, it's a massive yeah. number. I mean, to think, yeah. we recently read a study don't know how real the study is, although it is, it is a peer-reviewed study. But it's said by the year 2030, mm -hmm. men will be unable to have children unassisted. Now, let's not even say it's 2030. Let's say yeah. it's 2050. Yeah. That's terrifying. It is. It is. And <clears throat> I would be more comfortable saying 2050 or even a little bit later than that. But I'll say a couple of things on that. The first mm -hmm. is the trend line is extraordinarily clear. Mm -hmm. There is no question about the trend line and whether sperm counts are going down and how this is affecting people's ability to have kids. Um, the second part of it is, it seems like the rate of decline is accelerating. Yep. So a recent study overseen by Dr. Shauna Swan, whose work is phenomenal, by the way, um, suggests that actually not only was sperm, uh, sperm count and concentration and these kind of indicators of sperm quality going down about 1% year over year, it looks like the decline nowadays since the year 2000 is more like 2.6% or greater. Every single year, 2.6%. And it, it doesn't sound like that large of a number. Hold on, it's accelerating yeah. every year, 2.6%? This is what the latest study showed. And again, this was peer reviewed and published and you know, overseen by a phenomenal researcher. Now, you can't always tell with 100% you know, certainty. There's, there's choice of which studies you include when you're doing this meta-analysis. But certainly the key takeaway for me was the problem is bad. It looks like it's getting worse and we need to be doing something about it. It's rare that I'm actually out of breath. I am out of breath because I didn't realize it's accelerating at such a fast rate. 2.6% means yeah. over the course of four years. Yeah. I mean, you're getting close to, actually the course yeah. of 12 years, you're doubling, yeah. right? And, and this is, you know, we, we use the term sometimes just for dramatic effect, right? But we say spermageddon, right? Mm -hmm. Spermageddon is a world, or sperm count zero is a world where men are basically unable to conceive naturally. Yep. And the only way that you will be able to have children is through assisted reproductive techniques known as ART. Mm -hmm. uh, and that might be intrauterine insemination, IUI, uh, in vitro fertilization, IVF, using ICSI, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. I mean, mm -hmm. these, by the way, are not straightforward procedures. They're not accessible to everyone, especially people living in fertility deserts who are not near a clinic. And by the way, this is expensive. Yeah. I'm paying... Yeah. $75,000 upfront in cash for two cycles of IVF. Yeah, it's, I it's, mean, it's, it's unattainable. Yeah. And, and by the way, I mean, you're in the fortunate position where you can, right? The number of people who cannot afford to pay that amount, right? And, and this, by the way, is why employers are covering it, yep. insurers are beginning to cover it. I mean, we even do some work with the US military, which is starting to cover this as well, because this is a basic biological need that people want to have families, but they want to have biological kids yep. with the people they love. Yep. 
And, it's, and we're living in a world where we're not able to do that. That's a scary thing. I, and and I'll, I'll just say, I mean, I always say wanting to have biological kids is pure narcissism. Pure narcissism. Because you know what? I want little kids that look at least half like me. But I want them to look just a little mm -hmm. bit like me. That's why we want to have biological kids. We all should be adopting. I think we all know that. We should be adopting. But the vast, vast majority of people who want kids don't want to adopt because they want kids who kind of look like them, right? who may have personality traits like them. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? But I certainly want to have biological kids of my own. It's really interesting. So my father was a, he was a particle physicist, mm -hmm. very logical person. Yeah. And he thought in terms of the evolutionary process. Mm -hmm. And all he drove into my head yeah. was Saad. The yeah. only thing you are put on this earth to do yeah. is to create another one of you so a, my seed <laughs> yes, can live correct, on. Correct, and I heard correct. it since I was three. Correct. And so is there a little <laughs> bit of narcissism? Yeah. Sure. But 100%. is it like a, just an innate yeah. biological it need is. to make it sure is. that you are passing on and to know that you can't? Yeah. And I think that the other scary thing is, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head before, we continue to live our life like there are no consequences. Correct. We are just... Correct. In New York City, perfect example mm. where you and I are right now, right. to be 35 and to not be in a relationship and to mm. not even be thinking about children yet right. is completely normal. Right. Now, the scary thing is, for women, 35 is considered a geriatric pregnancy. Geriatric and, pregnancy. And life's dirty little secret is we right. still feel like we're in our 20s in our head Absolutely. at 35 especially, for I mean, children. Especially New York. Especially you New feel York. five to 10 years younger than you actually are. And so like the, the, the mm. gravity of the problem is... One, very real, no one's talking about it. Or I should say, people are starting to talk about it. It's incredibly yeah. stigmatized. Yeah. So I guess, you know, talk to me about the stigma that you have faced when you talk to men about this problem. Yeah, so um, let's go back to eggs. Yep. Because we always say it takes two to tango. If you want to have a healthy baby, you need a healthy sperm and a healthy egg. Now, 10 years ago, Egg freezing. How common is egg freezing today? I mean, how many of your I mean, friends or at least every in one of my friends circles, talk about it? Yeah, they're, they're doing either, it. Either doing it or thinking about doing it yep. or saving up to do it or they're going to join an employer mm -hmm. who offers benefits so that they can do it. I mean, this is increasingly common. And you take a look at that, and, and we forget that as of 2013, the ASRM, the American Society for Reproductive, Medi Reproductive Medicine, considered egg freezing an experimental procedure. 10 years ago. 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Look at the change over the past 10 years. This is the path that sperm freezing is going down. Mm -hmm. Right? So, I mean, we really are, um, you know, on, on, on the coattails of the egg freezing and kind of all this talk about female fertility. But mm -hmm. what we say is, well, this view that fertility is a women's issue is outdated. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'll start with that. Because if you look at couples that are facing infertility, the stats are broadly one-third of that infertility is coming from male factor infertility. One-third of that infertility is coming from joint or unexplained infertility. Mm -hmm. And one-third is coming from female infertility. So what that tells us is, broadly speaking, infertility is just as likely to be from the male or sperm-producing partner as their counterpart. Mm -hmm. And so you put that together and you say, okay, well, we always thought that men can have kids whenever they want, right? Which you do see celebrities having kids into their 70s, right? We think that fertility is just an issue that women have to think about because they have a steeper biological clock. Mm -hmm. We think that men don't have to worry about all of this stuff because we're just going around, you know, popping sperm off left, right, and center. But the reality is quite different. The reality is quite different, especially to your earlier point, as we're trying to have kids later and later in life. The fact mm -hmm. that a third of infertility is related to men yeah. is, I would argue, one of the least known fact yeah. for men yes. as they're aging or yes. even at our age, I would imagine men probably think 5% yeah. of infertility is we have to spend a ton of time up front with guys basically saying, do you plan to get pregnant at any point soon or in right. the future? Right. And they always say yeah. why. And we say, well, yeah. there's a couple routes. Yeah. You can take fertility medications to improve your endogenous testosterone yeah. quality. Clomid. That'll actually help. That'll actually yeah. have you, make you have children faster. Yeah. But if you take testosterone, exogenous testosterone, mm -hmm. it then actually shuts it down over the course of right. a long time. And you're right, right. It's a very, they're interlinked in a very interesting manner that most people don't know about. Right. Now, one of the things I want to actually talk about really quickly was you had mentioned that there is a study on dogs. Yeah. So let's talk about this is, in my view, one of the most interesting studies out there. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this is we know 
that sperm counts are going down in part due to uh, chemical exposures, BPAs, and phthalates. Mm -hmm. These are known as forever chemicals, by the way. And again, to mention Dr. Shana Swan's work, I mean, she wrote a book called Countdown. Mm -hmm. that is talking about the, basically the countdown towards sperm count zero. And she talks about the kind of environmental exposures that we're exposed to. And it's hard for us to separate out, well, how much of this is coming just from the way that we live our lives or where we live our lives? Mm -hmm. And there was a study from the University of Nottingham that found that dogs that live in human households, relative to dogs living outside of human households, faced a similar level of sperm quality decline. And first of all, I want to know whose job it is to test the sperm of dogs. Because <laughs> I thought, you know, our job is a little, you know, eclectic. Mm -hmm. I think that's taking it next level. How do you collect the sperm samples? I don't want to know, to be totally honest. Um, but that study found, I mean, they looked at about 42 to 97 dogs that were studied each year. They collected semen from the dogs. They took a look at the progressive motility of those dog sperm. So basically, what percentage of their sperm is actually swimming forward normally. And over a 26-year period, they found a notable decline in sperm quality. So it was between 1988 and 1998, they found that, that progressive motility declined about by about 2.5% year over year. Uh, and then from 2000 to 2014, that uh, rate of decline was about 1.2% year over year. And this was dogs that were basically in service and doing work for humans. Mm -hmm. And after they, so they were facing that sperm decline up front. Then even after they retired and they were just, you know, living their best dog lives, they were still seeing a decline in their sperm quality. Um, and it was the first time that we found this type of decline in, you know, in, in non-human species. And it really suggests that it's because those dogs are living in human households. Mm -hmm. They're exposed to, you know, the paint on the walls, yep. the food that they're eating. They're eating out of dog bowls that have, you know, the dishwashing liquid that you put into your dishwasher. And, you know, you're, you're, you're combing and brushing their fur with a plastic comb, maybe. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're just exposed to all the same things that you are. They're yep. maybe even eating your food. Uh, and so it just really reinforces this idea that, we are surrounded in our households by chemicals that are helping make us infertile. I like to think that we do a very good job in our house of removing yep. as many environmental contaminants as possible, right. but the truth is they're almost everywhere, right? Yeah. And so I guess the question for you is, are there things that we can actually do to yep. save ourselves or even yep. reduce our exposures? Yeah, and, and I mean, it's, it's funny because you and I were talking about deodorant right before this podcast, which I guess for guys like us is a totally normal conversation to have. Like, how much chemical exposure do you have in your, in your deodorant? <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, um, it's tricky. It's tricky. And I'll, I'll start by saying I used to make fun of people who I call kind of hippy-dippy. They're like, oh, everything 100%. needs to be organic yep. and chemical-free and so on. I'm like, okay, guys, like, mm -hmm. this is just the world that we live in. Calm down. And then as I started to get into the male fertility world, you know, six or seven years ago, I started learning about these studies, and I have now become that same person and yep. even worse. So, you know, laundry detergent, first of all. You want chemical-free, fragrance-free. By the way, a lot of people don't know that fragrances have these types of forever chemicals mm -hmm. that stay in your bodies, right? And, and you're wearing the clothes on your body all day that is being washed with that laundry detergent. You're sleeping on bed sheets that are washed with that laundry detergent, right? So you need to make sure that's clean. Same with dishwashing liquid, right? Again, it goes onto all the plates, the utensils, everything you use to eat, yep. right? You wanna make sure that you're not using plastics. Plastics, by the way, um, BPAs and phthalates are basically chemicals that go to harden or soften plastics. Mm -hmm. They are some of the worst contributors to all this. So for example, I don't use Tupperware. Yep. I don't use Teflon coated pans or pots or anything like that. Uh, I definitely never put anything with plastic into a microwave. Mm -hmm. and that is just begging for your sperm count to go down that day. Um, you know, and so there, there's certain tactical things that you can do, but in general, organic, fragrance-free, you know, chemical-free to the greatest extent that you can. Mm -hmm. The tricky thing is, I mean, you, 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 you again, you look at Dr. Swan's work and she says, okay, well, ATM receipts have these types of chemicals. Uh, your shower curtain has these types of chemicals. It just, it, it sometimes feels like an impossible task. Um, and so there's steps you can take and you, you should be taking more and more steps to reduce your exposure. But I don't think there's as yet a, you know, just boom, this is the magic bullet. Hold on. Hmm. If you're telling me ATM receipts, then you're telling me grocery receipts. You're yeah. telling me any Everything. kind of receipt. Everything. Yeah. You're saying whenever I touch that. Oh yeah. Chemicals. Forever, it's everywhere. Forever chemicals. You know, actually it was, I think it was the CDC found a measurable level of phthalates mm -hmm. in every single American. That's scary. 
That's scary. And by the way, the amount of regulation for these types of chemicals in the US, where we live, is lower than in Europe, the EU, and kind of other parts of the world that have been more progressive mm -hmm. around these types of topics. I, I always joke, it's like, a, it's like an SOS situation. It's a, it's a, it's a save our sperm. Uh, <laughs> we actually, we really need more regulation around chemical exposures and, 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 and you know, these endocrine disruptors. They are endocrine disruptors. They affect the way that our hormones work. It's interesting, right? Most people don't realize this, but those plastics, those fertilizers, the yeah. PCBs, for a man's body, they resemble estrogenic compounds. Right. And those estrogenic right. compounds get into our body and tell the hormone regulating centers in our brain, i.e. our pituitary and hypothalamus, yes. to basically shut down endogenous production. Right. And it is literally a catch-22 because it's the same process your body uses when you may use too much testosterone as well, right. too. And right. so it has kind of formed this downward spiral for men all across society right now. Yeah. And, you know, talking about ways that we can reduce our overall exposures, can we really win? Is this something that we can actually get ahead of? Or is it just like a, a zero sum game? You, you can't win. I, in, in the world that we live in, you cannot win. All you can do is lose less. Lose less. Lose less. All you can say is, I recognize and understand that I will be exposed to all kinds of, it, all kinds of chemicals that I wish I weren't. Mm -hmm. And I can take as many steps as possible to reduce my exposure, but there's going to be a baseline of, of exposure that you just, you're not going to be able to get around as long as you are a functioning member of society. Now, first of all, you don't have to be a functioning member of society. Um, but what I've always said, and I, I say, I mean, it's, it's half a joke, but I think I'm serious about it. Mm -hmm. If I were with my partner choosing to have children, I would want us to go and live on a farm, you know, in a remote part of the country, basically f as far away from society as possible, yep. certainly in the couple of months leading to the pregnancy, but especially when my partner would be pregnant. Mm -hmm. Because those are the nine months, I mean, that are basically determining the formation of, uh, of, of your fetus, of your child. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll take a moment to say, we think about sperm as being not that important as far as fertility is concerned. Mm -hmm. But we've also learned that sperm can carry DNA damage. Mm -hmm. And you can test for this. So we offer, for example, DNA fragmentation testing. So how much hmm. DNA damage there is in your sperm. Um, it's believed that DNA damage increases due to exposures to these, these types of chemicals. Mm -hmm. Now, spermatogenesis takes, call it two and a half to three months, which is the formation of new sperm. Yep. That's approximately how long it takes. And so if you can reduce your exposure for at least you know, the two, three months prior to getting your partner pregnant, you're going to have less DNA damage in your sperm. Hmm. If you can take supplements, so CoQ10 in particular yep. is a great supplement to take if you want to reduce that kind of DNA damage in your sperm. But really what I would want to do is run away from society, go live on a farm in the middle of nowhere, hang out with my partner. We'd be bored out of our, out of our minds probably <laughs> for nine months. Um, but that's how you're going to have the healthiest possible baby. And by the way, DNA damage, right, or even just advanced paternal age, which is older dads, um, you know, is associated with higher rates of infertility, hmm. higher rates of miscarriage, um, you know, just, just not being able to conceive with your partner for so much longer. And you look into the numbers and you realize, okay, well, advanced maternal age associated with worse birth outcomes, associated with lower birth weight, is associated with gestational diabetes for the female partner, is associated with increase in, in you know, uh, autism rates or autism spectrum disorder, increase in schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and so on and so forth. And you realize just how important the sperm is and having healthy sperm. So all this to say, I want to, you know, run away from society for, for nine months to a year, <laughs> not talk to anyone, not do anything, at least until I've impregnated my partner, in which case, you know, I can make maybe day trips. Day trips city. back. Day trips. Two, two day trips. But I think the thing that you're yeah. saying, which also, and I don't, I don't yeah. think the purpose is to scare mm -hmm. people, but not only could you mm -hmm. theoretically not get pregnant, right. but the bigger thing is once you're pregnant, mm -hmm. Or I should say, on the way leading to getting pregnant, if you have DNA damage, you can provide mm -hmm. your partner, your spouse, mm -hmm. with actual health complications, right. and you can actually right. give your child yeah. a lower probability of being healthy in the world. And so it really is yes. at the heart of yes. life that we're kind of talking about it. So here's something you said. Yeah. You said, you can't run away from it. Mm -hmm. You can just lose less. Right. So that being said, it's kind of like uh, your hair as you get older. <laughs> oh, God. I'm, I'm going through it right now. Yeah, I'm going yeah, well. through it right now. I look, <laughs> look at it every day. Um, so what, what is it that you guys have done to really solve this problem? Actually, let me, let me even first say, before I get into this, sure. why do you care about this problem? Yeah. 
<laughs> why do I care about sperm? Um, well, first of all, don't we all? Mm -hmm. But why do I care enough to have started a company I've been running? I mean, you give your entire years. life. You give um, your life to this. I have, I have given, yeah, we always say blood, sweat, tears, and semen. That's what you have to do. <laughs> so I'll take you back to maybe seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went through a bit of a scare. So I had some very hot coffees and teas spilled all over my lap. Mm. And I got second degree burns. It was extremely painful. And I'm mm. in the middle of nowhere. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They rush me to, you know, my team rushes me to a burn unit, um, you know, and, and kind of the, the burns get treated. I have to fly back to Canada, which is where I was living at the time. Long story short, second degree burns heal and they do heal fully, but it took a month and a half mm. for me to go back to normal. And it was a painful month and a half. And it was around that time I was starting my master's and one of my classmates had recently gone through um, chemotherapy for testicular cancer. Mm -hmm. And he happened to mention offhand that he banked his sperm, he froze his sperm prior to starting chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And I had just had this pretty traumatic accident, very close to parts of me that are very important to me, mm -hmm. not just as a person, but to my future ability to have kids. Yep. And so that was kind of my light bulb moment. And I said, well, let me freeze my sperm. I'd never, I'd never thought about it as a concept. And, it wasn't anywhere near as common or well-known as it is today in 2023. And so that's what I do. I Google, you know, I was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the time. I Google local sperm bank. I find the local sperm bank. It's right next door to my favorite Chinese restaurant. Or it's like mm -hmm. just very weird vibes going mm -hmm. into it. <laughs> and I go in and I, I won't belabor the point, but the most awkward, clinical, dehumanizing, weird experience I've ever been through they had, they had, you know, like, here, surf, just uh, please go jerk off in this room. Uh, you have 10 minutes, by the way, because mm -hmm. someone needs to use the, room right after, use the room right after you. You walk in, black leather couch, right? Magazines on the table. You don't want to touch anything. Mm. You know, you, you, you do what you have to do. You give them the sample. You wait a week. You get the results. I mean, just everything about it was terrible. Mm. And I came away from that, and I could not, it just, I could not put together how important and profound this felt. I got my results back and I was fine and I knew that I would be able to have a family someday. Mm -hmm. and I froze my sperm. Felt amazing. Mm -hmm. And I could not, and you contrast that with how awkward and weird that process was. And I became fixated on this idea to the extent that I've been talking about sperm to so many people for so long with such passion that you know my, my friends started calling me the sperm king six <laughs> or seven years ago. I finally bought the URL, by the way, spermking.com. Mm -hmm. uh, bought that last year. Um, and you know it was it was... Something so important, something so awkward, and that really set me down the path of starting Legacy. I said, there needs to be a better way. Mm -hmm. You need to do this in a way that's affordable, where a fraction of what you would cost at a clinic. It needs to be accessible. You can do it entirely from home. Yep. And it needs to make you feel not like you're a sickly patient, but like you're someone who's investing in wanting to freeze their sperm, right? understand their fertility, and just be thoughtful. And really, you're investing in an insurance policy for future you. So walk me through yeah. in as much detail. Hmm. I'm someone that cares about actually freezing my sperm. Sure. We'll talk about sure. who would care about that in a second. Yeah. But tell me about the experience. Sure. Sure. Easy. So yep. you go to our website, givelegacy.com. Mm -hmm. uh, and you look through the various packages. You pick one. You go, to, you go through checkout. And I'll, I'll just mention... There's three ways that you might not even be paying out of pocket for a product. Mm -hmm. um, we have national insurance coverage with multiple major carriers. So United Healthcare, Aetna, Cigna, Emblem, you name it. Wow. Um, you likely have coverage if you're in any state in the country. So if you have any sort of medical condition, you're not paying for so this out of pocket. I'm, will I have to pay anything? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, there's, you know, we both know healthcare in, in this country is a mess. Um, there may be co-pays or maybe deductibles, right? So you may be paying someone out of pocket, but mm -hmm. it will actually be covered by your insurance provider. It will count towards your annual deductible and so on. So it's common for someone with insurance to maybe pay $100 or $150 out of pocket. Unbelievable. But, Great. Know, still extraordinarily affordable. So that's one. You might be covered by your insurer. The second is we work with all of the major fertility benefits providers, Carrot, Maven, Wind Fertility, Progeny, Kind Body, and so on, to offer our services. So your employer may cover it. And so there's about, I think, 10 plus million lives, employee lives, that have this type of coverage where they're basically not paying out of pocket. Mm -hmm. So it is if you remember the US military. Yep. So we have an exclusive program with the Navy SEALs, for example. You freeze your sperm with us for free. We do the same with the Green Berets. We have a, you know, we, we've recently signed a partnership with the VA, so on and so forth. So there's some ways in which you may not be even paying for our product out of pocket. Now, you go on the website, you order the kit, you'll get it at your home within one, maybe two business days. Mm -hmm. You then take as long as you want to produce a sperm sample that's not on us. That's on that's the only part of the Part of the work that you have to do. Okay. Um, you then scan a QR code. 
someone comes to your house that day, picks up the kit, right? It's all packaged, it's tamper-proof and so on. Um, we do priority overnight shipping to our lab. The following morning, um, we'll do a full semen analysis on the sperm. Mm -hmm. uh, so you will actually get clinic grade semen analysis. So volume, count, concentration, motility, morphology, um, potentially DNA fragmentation. You do all of that. Um, what we'll then do is we'll take your sample and we'll divide it into two. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll, f we'll freeze all your sperm, right? So you can choose to pay for sperm freezing or not. Sperm freezing is, I mean, I think our, our cheapest option is about $80 a year, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's eighty dollars a yeah, year. Yeah, I mean, at some clinics, you're paying five hundred to thousand dollars a year. It's, wow. it's a fraction of the cost. And so we'll divide your sample into two. We will actually store your sample in two different geographic locations. We hmm. call this multi-geo storage. Mm -hmm. um, we've all seen stories about fertility clinics that have a meltdown or human error or any sort of issue. So we have redundancy built in, as one of my friends called it. It's load balancing. <laughs> and so we separate it out and send it off to two different geographic locations yep. to make sure that your sperm is safe for decades to come. And the last thing I'll say here is um, what many people don't realize is you can freeze sperm for decades hmm. with no loss in quality. So they've unfrozen sperm after, you know, after 40 plus years, they've used it to have twins. Hmm. Right? Sperm is very biologically simple. Eggs are much more complex. Um, and so you can freeze your sperm for literally decades. But hmm. I shouldn't be doing this myself at home. What's that? I should not be doing this myself at home. Correct. We, they are suspended in negative 196 degrees Celsius, liquid nitrogen tanks, advanced security around the clock monitoring, daily checks, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's, there's a lot of steps that we take to bring any risk to you or your sperm as close to zero as humanly possible. And so do I have to freeze my sample yeah. before shipping it? How does it even make yeah. it over to you guys? Yeah, so we actually, we use something that comes from the horse semen industry. So we've talked about dog semen, now let's talk about horse semen. Yep. So the sperm of award-winning stallions, do you know how much it's worth? Like one ejaculate, which by the way is I, larger than a human ejaculate. I know we're, we've done this for our French bulldogs and we, there's, a, there's, a, there's a ton of money and it's like $3,000 yeah. per. And so I've got to imagine for an award-winning award stallion, yeah. it's got to be fifty, a hundred thousand dollars Exactly, you're talking in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for one ejaculate because mm -hmm. that's award-winning sperm, basically. Yep. And so, um, what happened is a sperm preservative was developed over the years mm -hmm. to help keep that sperm safe during transport. Hmm. That sperm preservative works on different types of sperm, human sperm included. Mm -hmm. And so when you'll receive your kit uh, from us at home, you basically have, there's a couple of different components of the kit. So there's the you know temperature regulation and the insulation and so on, but you'll have an empty deposit cup, it's yours to fill. And then there's a sperm preservative called a buffering medium. Mm -hmm. So after you've ejaculated and you've produced a sperm sample, you add the sperm preservative, you close it up, there's, you know, it, 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 it clicks when it locks, you swirl it around gently, and that makes sure that the sperm and the buffering medium are, you know, are, are, um, are mixing, mm -hmm. put it back in the kit. Now, the buffering medium, what it does is it basically keeps your sperm safe during transport. So on, when it's making its way back to our clinic, it, it suspends and in many ways keeps the sperm alive during transport. Hmm. Otherwise, sperm would only survive for a few hours out of the body. Um, and so when it gets to our lab, we will centrifuge your sample and we will separate out your sperm from the buffering medium. Mm -hmm. The sperm then gets taken care of. There's a few different steps that we go through. I won't go into all the operational complexity, but we have probably some of the most robust SOPs, standard operating procedures of any lab in the country. We handle more sperm samples than any lab in the country. I mean, you know, I get to say at board meetings that we're drowning in sperm. We, re <laughs> we really are. I mean, we have some mm -hmm. photos of just like, you know, 100 plus kits arriving that same day. Mm -hmm. um, and our lab technicians who call themselves, it's um, entirely female, by the way, they call themselves the sperm spinners. Uh, they, have, they had t-shirts made, which is amazing, <laughs> right? And they'll, and they'll get to work analyzing all of those samples. Wow. And I, I want to make sure I understand yeah. this. So there's no freezing required. Correct. It is literally just mixing it with this medium. Correct. Giving it a little shake. Yep. The sperm travel mm -hmm. animated alive Correct. to your location. Yep. With, is with it, I should mention, so there will be some decline in the motility that was, of sperm yep. during the transport. But for the purposes of future use, especially if you're planning on using it for IVF, it's largely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, what most couples do nowadays is what's called ICSI, so intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where you will actually take out one single healthy sperm mm -hmm. from a semen sample and you will inject it directly into the egg yep. to create the embryo. And so the decline in motility is largely irrelevant for that purpose. Great, so you can basically say we can target it on the one that looks the healthiest, motility exactly. not important. Normal shape, 
good progressive motility. It's not swimming in circles. I mean, and, and I, I say this because the vast majority of your sperm will actually be abnormal. Mm -hmm. So some of them will have two heads. Mm. Some of them will swim in circles. You know, some of them might have, um, you know, it, they, they might be deficient in multiple different ways. Uh, and so you'll take out one healthy looking normal sperm uh, and you will inject that directly into the egg. Now, one of the mistakes I made on one of my samples, uh -oh. I didn't I didn't choose to have the STI treated or testing sure. completed. Sure. Why is that important? A couple of reasons. The first of which is if you have an STI, you should know about it. Yep. Um, and I mean, I'm always shocked by the stats around sexually transmitted infections. Mm -hmm. I think it's about a million Americans each month are diagnosed with just like the most common STIs, like mm -hmm. chlamydia or gonorrhea or so on. So the numbers out there are staggering. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, you should just, you should know. And so to be able to do STI testing from home, which we offer as well, is it's great, right? Mm -hmm. I use it myself. And the second part of it is, if you ever want to use your sample in the future, clinics will typically want to know that you have done an STI test so that they can verify that they are not implanting a sperm that has an STI yep. into your partner. Obviously, there's risks associated with that. So the more STIs that you can test for when you're freezing your sperm, the better. It'll mm -hmm. make your life easier when you are using the sample down the line. And so there's the STI option, or yeah. do you do that with every sample? Correct. No, it's an, it's an optional. It's optional. It's not required, right? Mm -hmm. and, and for you, you might say, look, you know, I mean, cl clinics will always work with the patients, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you have a sperm sample that's been frozen, let's say you've gone through chemotherapy, you're functionally infertile today, right? Mm -hmm. Of course you're gonna find a way to use your sample, um, right? So it's, it's not mandatory. What yeah. is a sperm yeah. sample transfer? Yeah. So let's say you actually wanna use your sample. You wanna to go to a clinic and you say, hey, you know, me and my partner wanna use a sample that we froze the legacy five or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a number of forms that we have to fill out documentation, you verify when the sample was produced, was there STI testing, what was, you know, so we do something called a post-thaw motility check. So yep. after you've frozen your sperm, a little while later, we'll actually test a tiny, tiny little fraction to make sure it froze well mm -hmm. and that it thawed well, right? So we'll want to know what was the motility of the sample after freezing. Uh, you then need to bring on a cryo shipper, mm -hmm. right? So you need to actually take the sample out and, and everything for us is, it's, the, the amount of operational complexity behind the scenes is staggering. I mean, we've mm -hmm. been doing this for five years. We do this more than anyone else. We probably do more shipments than anyone else at this point. Um, and so you need to bring on, you know, a cryo shipper. You take out the vial. You make sure it's frozen. Uh, everything is very temperature regulated. You never, ever want the sperm to be unfrozen before you're choosing to. You ship it over to the clinic. They then have to sign 100 other forms to make mm -hmm. sure they arrived on time, right? There's, there's, of course, a lot of liability in case anything goes yep. wrong. Um, and they just want to make sure they understand everything about the sperm sample yep. before, which makes sense, which makes sense. And is, and the industry is still living in the 1970s as far as like, I think we've had to fax a few documents, right? Which- Yes, is, there's so much faxing. Kind of, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, but you ship it over and the clinic will take care of the rest. Mm. You built this company, you guys yeah. are drowning in loads drowning. of sperm. <laughs> You've given your blood, loads, sweat, loads of customers. blood, yes. sweat, and sperm to this. Yeah. What have been the, the challenges building this business? Because yeah. it is a very sensitive business oh, like yeah. ours. Oh, if you yeah. get it wrong, there are very real yeah. problems that you have yeah. to answer to. Number one is you need to make sure the science is strong and the science is robust. Yep. You need to surround yourself by the leading specialists in male fertility. And I remember in the early days of Legacy, I literally flew around. I mean, I flew to the University of Sheffield in the UK mm -hmm. to go and meet with Dr. Alan Pacey, who has gotten, I believe it's an order of the British, either OBE or MBE, but it's basically a, an award from the British government, from the Queen in recognition of his contributions to the field of andrology. Mm -hmm. right, so flew to go meet with him and ask him to join the Legacy Advisory Board, right? And he's been a phenomenal resource to us. Um, I remember I flew out to Yale to meet with Dr. Marsha Inhorn, who's phenomenal when it comes to understanding how male fertility, you know, especially male fertility across the world and norms around male fertility. I did that with Dr. Paul Turek, who's all, you know, all the way out on the West Coast, one of the leading urologists, right? And so you do that and you build out a very robust team around you to make sure that the science is clean. The second is you want to bring on a chief medical officer as soon as possible. Yep. We did that at the seed stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think most companies usually wait till a little bit later, but what I say to my team always is we are dealing with life and death, right? This is literally the ability to create life. It's also why we haven't built a jokey brand, mm -hmm. although believe me, the temptation <laughs> is there, right? Um, you know, we built a very serious and kind of premium brand around yep. what we do. Um, we've made sure we're science first in everything we do. You can't take any chances when it comes no, to sperm. And, to and serious what I always say um, is sperm is funny until it's not. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Sperm is funny when you're 13. Frankly, it's still funny today. It's still right? funny. It's still funny Always funny. Always funny. Yep. Until you're trying to have a child with a person you love the yep. most in the world. And you're trying to bring a family into this world. And so it just, it fundamentally is a topic that matters to a lot of people. Um, and that's been my belief since day one. And so, you know, we built a serious science first premium brand. And now to answer your earlier question, which is, you know, what challenges have we faced? My God, I mean... Mm -hmm. <laughs> The, the amount of testing and validation you need to do to manufacture anything at all is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, anytime you're dealing with, you know, things with atoms, not just bits and bytes, right? The complexity just increases dramatically. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're dealing with a kit, you're dealing with a sperm, you're testing, you're validating, you're dealing with labs, you're hiring lab technicians. You need to make sure everyone's trained appropriately. And then, you know, you're doing all of this while dealing with the healthcare industry in the US, which as we both know is a nightmare, mm -hmm. and you're just going through the normal challenges of building an early stage company, right? You're, you're hiring, you're fundraising, you're, um, you know, you're building a, a culture for your team. I mean, none of these things are trivial to do. So it certainly has been a hell of a ride. You know what, it's interesting because we spend a lot of time in this industry and arguably you're a direct to consumer, maybe you use the word telehealth company. Sure. And the reality is the majority of them that are out there are marketing companies that quite literally just spin off medications. 100%. We know the way those businesses work 100%. really well. But what you guys are doing is very similar to us. Yeah. It is complex. Because the moment you have to take samples from mm -hmm. a person's home and move yeah. them to a facility that they have to be tested in, right. and then not only for you guys to be tested, mm -hmm. you have to keep the samples. And at the right. end of the day, yeah. You may have to keep that sample for 15 years, right. and the reality is that that sample becomes useful in 15 years. And if you mess it up 15 years in the future... The longer the sample's been frozen, the more valuable it is for you. Perfectly said. Mm. So I guess when you start thinking about where this industry goes, yeah. I want you to fast forward 5, 10 years and tell me yeah. where are we in regards to men's fertility, and yeah. more specifically, maybe... Actually, let's start there, and then I have sure. a second follow-up. Sure. Oof. Okay, uh, well, if I look out, or when I look out five or ten years into the future, which is, you know, it's a big part of my job, first of all, sperm freezing is following the same path and momentum and trajectory as egg freezing. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference between the two, though. Yep. Egg freezing, difficult, yep. expensive, yep. invasive. Yep. You are going in for a surgical extraction of your eggs under anesthesia with a doctor. Yeah. That is not guaranteed at the Yeah, end that, is not, that guaranteed. is not guaranteed. You don't know how many eggs you're going to end up with. Yeah. I mean, it is just, it is a brick and mortar, in person, complex procedure. That, that is that, a by the way, three costs, week, yeah. three week lead up to it. Yes. Very focused. You're basically simulating the early stages of pregnancy. Yep. You're injecting yourself every day. So, all this is to say, you're doing all of that. And by the way, you're paying $10,000 or more for the privilege of doing all of that. You compare that with sperm freezing which entails you masturbating at home. And by the way, the cost is not $10,000. You're paying a couple hundred bucks up front. You yep. might not even be paying out of pocket at all. Yep. You're paying less than $100 a year for the freezing. Right? And so the path we're on is very clear. In, in the future, legacy will be the norm. Mm -hmm. Every man is going to freeze his sperm. Every person who produces sperm mm -hmm. will freeze it. Because I want to make sure I'm, we, we work a lot with the trans community. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of transgender women who are born biologically male and will freeze their sperm before transitioning. So. Any person who has sperm will freeze it. Yep. And you're going to do this at a younger and younger age, especially as we learn more about the sperm count declines, more about the effects of chemicals on us, more about the increase in infertility. It becomes a no-brainer. That is the biggest change that I see, and I see it happening very, very quickly. What's really interesting about this specific problem is that there are not a bunch of 25-year-old men, which is arguably when your sperm is healthiest, sitting around and thinking about right. how do I make sure this, these bad boys don't go to waste, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. It is generally when you have a problem mm -hmm. that you are now starting right. to think about, well, I should freeze my sperm, but the reality is that you needed them from 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. How do you enable the shift yeah. of a younger generation to care about this? Yeah. It's a question we think about all the time. It really comes down to education. It comes down to awareness, right? And mm -hmm. so one of the things we did is we brought on, um, we brought on celebrity investors. So, you know, Justin Bieber, DJ Khaled, um, Orlando Bloom, The Weeknd, and so on, because we believe that having higher profile individuals talking about male fertility and sperm is just going to help push the field forward. The mm -hmm. second, and I think that Hone already does this excellently, is you want to have high quality 
top tier content so that when you are Googling this topic, you are coming across our resources, right? And so the number of times I've Googled something about testosterone or about sperm and I found our respective articles being the featured snippet on Google, which really is just reflective of the fact that we've built up you know, a reputation and domain authority over time. So really that education component is extremely important. Um, and you do all of that and, and you know, you, you wanna invest in, well, what is the job to be done for people with sperm? Well, at some point they may want to have children. So you make sure that you're tailoring the message and what matters to a guy at the age of 20 mm-hmm. is gonna be different than what matters to someone who's 25 or 30 or 35 or 40. And so you have to be very thoughtful about the message that you are sending. And I always think about this in the context of Roman and him, so mm-hmm. you know, two big companies that sold basically erectile dysfunction medication, sold generics. Both grew quite quickly, but they grew in different ways. And I've always liked this analogy because, as one of our investors put it, um, he says it's really just Darwinism. Men care about two things: their ability to have an erection mm-hmm. and their ability to have kids. And I take a look at a company like Roman that built a you know more serious brand, they vertically integrated as did we, and they targeted a specific type of consumer. So HIMS consumers tend to be younger, 20s, 30s, row consumers tend to be older, 40s, 50s. And so even within this space, there's a lot of room for differentiation. And so we think a lot about how do you target someone who's in their 20s and 30s versus someone who's in their 40s maybe, and might want to have kids sooner rather than later. I'm going to turn to something that's actually a little bit boring. Okay. Um, but interestingly, it's probably become a large part of your life as sure. it has become a large part of mine because we are building very serious medical brands based upon safety and efficacy for patients. Right. What does the regulatory world look yeah. like as it comes to sperm yeah. freezing? Whew. Well, there's two ways to think about it. The first is if you are planning on having a child with a sexually intimate partner, mm-hmm. at which point regulations around sperm or sperm freezing are much simpler because the idea is you will be having unprotected sex with that person regardless. Mm-hmm. Right? And so requirements around STI testing, for example, are lower. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's a lot of regulations. I mean, if you're running a lab or if you're doing freezing, there's all sorts of licenses you need to secure. You know, you need your, your uh, lab needs to be a CLIA certified and CAP certified and all of this is regulated by and overseen by the FDA. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's quite a lot of regulatory work that you need to make sure you're meeting. Um, This is doubly the case if you're planning on using your sperm for the purposes of uh, third-party donation, so surrogacy, for example. Um, Then there's a whole suite of tasks and exercises that you need to go through before your sperm goes to someone who is not called a sexually intimate partner. Hmm. Uh, But for our purposes, there's a ton of regulations around the labs and how you run the labs. We get surprise visits and and inspections from CLIA and CAB and the FDA and so on. And that's just part of building a healthy lab culture. And so you can't enter into a space like this. And you mentioned companies that are largely marketing companies, right? We vertically integrated a long time ago. Mm-hmm. We've had our own lab since, I don't know, for years now. We did that very early in the business because you want to control as much of that end to end as possible. You want to be doing it yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a fair amount of regulatory work that goes behind that. What is one piece or information that you would give men mm-hmm. about their sperm health yeah. that isn't necessarily a plug for your product. Sure. Because by the way, yeah. everyone should do it. Yeah. Given. Right. I mean, it literally it is Especially an insurance policy. TRT, I mean, makes even TRT, more sense. I mean, if you're yeah. 25 years old, you should be doing it yeah. at this point in time right. because chances are by the time you're ready to have a child, right. you actually may not be able to. Correct. Correct. Whew. I would say, let's think about this. What would I say to guys who are, do we have an age range or just in general? What do you want guys to know about their sperm? Why don't you actually give me yeah. two? Give me okay. one for a 25-year-old yeah. kid and give yeah. me one for a guy that's probably in our, our demo. Okay, I like it. For 25, if you are 25 years old, you are really just entering the path into adulthood. You want to be thinking about future you because future you is going to have worse quality sperm. Future you is going to be more likely to face infertility. Future you may have had an STI. You may be one of those <laughs> 1 million Americans every single month who's getting an STI. Um, future you may have had an accident. Future you may have had... Uh, cancer, God forbid. Hmm. Future, you may be in the military. You may be deployed off in, in Afghanistan or somewhere, right? So be thoughtful about who you want to be in the future. And if you think you might want to have a family someday, then you should be freezing your sperm, right? Whether it's with us or elsewhere, you should be doing this. That's that's one. And, and for men who are a bit older, um, what you likely don't know is 
your sperm. It's a great biomarker of your overall health. Mm -hmm. Test your sperm. Understand your sperm quality. This will tell you, are you broadly speaking living a healthy life? And by the way, your sperm quality is predictive of everything from cardiovascular disease, diabetes, rates of certain types of cancer. I mean, your sperm can actually tell you so much more than you would think, and most men don't know that. So I do have to ask, now that yeah. you said that, yeah. where do you guys go in the future? For us, it's really, it's more, it's about distribution, it's about growth. Um, you know, we continue to sign contracts with insurers, we continue to sign contracts with the U.S. military, we continue to sign contracts with, you know, uh, fertility benefits providers and clinics. It's, we want to make sure that this is accessible to every single person in the United States who has sperm. And ultimately, you know, five or ten years down the line, we want to be building a global company to solve a global problem, right? And, and you know, we won't even go down the path of birth rates, which is a whole other podcast episode. Mm -hmm. Every developed country is having huge issues as far as birth rates are concerned. So it's a global problem. Our goal is to be a global solution. Unbelievable. Now, yeah. how can people get a hold of you? And yeah. If you want to get a hold of us, it's givelegacy.com. Uh, give like you are giving the gift of life. Mm. Uh, we're on Twitter at Legacy. We're on Instagram at GiveLegacyInc. All right, man. Yeah. Appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.